Hi, I'm Sharon Azrieli, and you're in my home in Canada for At Home in Canada. Today, we're going to see my interview with great Canadian designer, Karim Rashid. Karim Rashid was born in Cairo and came as a very young child to live in Toronto, Ontario. And I had the great privilege to interview him on May 20th, 2019. Today, his designs, he's got over 4,000 great designs, are featured in over 400 countries. Um, and he is working in over 40 countries in the world. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Hi, I'm so, so honored and delighted to welcome you to Home in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me today. Oh, pleasure. Okay, when I first saw Karim, I, I don't know why I thought that he wasn't tall from all of the previous videos that I had seen of him. So when he first walked into his office, I was like, sort of shocked you, you have had so many i've watched so many hours of your videos and i've seen you speak and you're a brilliant speaker and i don't want to actually revisit uh, all of the things that you've spoken uh, publicly about i'm going to try and get you to talk about new things sure and see if we can get some uncharted territory there's, in there's probably video. a few new things within me good That's, i know there are <laughs> i know that there are i talked with karen about how when he started uh, to study industrial design he was one of the first to go through the program at carleton university in ottawa so what i want to talk to you about first of all is let's talk about some canadian subjects sure okay First of all, I, I know you've spoken a little bit about your experience at Carleton. I have a little bit of personal uh, background there. And I know that you, uh, when you were there, that it was a new program. How has that program developed? And how would you like to see it develop? Mm -hmm. What can we do to encourage young industrial designers? You know, I, uh, well, first of all, I, I graduated in Carleton in uh, 82. And the first time I went back was about maybe 10 years after, you know, maybe even longer, about 15 years after, to make a talk, make a lecture. And um, even saw some of the same faculty that I had there. Um, but you know, I, I it, it, Carleton for industrial design was always a, a bit problematic because it seemed to be torn between, it's part of the engineering school and the architecture school. So a lot of times it, 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 it sometimes I think hasn't really still developed its own, mm, taken ownership of itself in a way, if, if that makes sense. Um, and even now in my latest visit there, I find it, it's, it's a good school. There's no question the students are rigorous and all that, but it, it has a tendency to be a bit more on the engineering side than the, let's say, I don't want to say poetic or conceptual side. Or creative. But it, yeah, it lacks a little bit of that, um, you know, of the, the addition to adding a sort of meaningful, beautiful things into one's life. When you when you think about, let's you know, say, problem solving, which is what design you know talked about for for a century, a lot of the problems have, in a sense, been solved. This is you know, you know so for example, if you design a chair today, we've we've solved the problem of the chair. Right. And in fact, I've heard there's you been say that a lot. Yeah, there's been a million of them. Right. So so the question is then, what are we adding to the landscape? I think I think the, the 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 without without getting too critical about the landscape is that we're saturating it now. So the question is, as designers, what is our contribution, and 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 are are we contributing things that actually are additive, meaning they're they're elevating human experience, right. or are we just putting more things into the world? Right. And it's a question that I struggle with personally right. a lot. And um, at the same time, you know, the mechanizations of the 20th century are are in place. So companies produce regardless. Designers or no designers, they're going to produce. Right, I've heard you say that. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Um, but anyway. Yes. So, but Carlton was a great was a, was a very good for me. It's a very good undergraduate experience because my my I was brought up with a father who was an artist and um, and very painterly in his way of thinking, and quite an intellectual, and uh, so I I had a lot of that as a child. So I needed some discipline, of some rigorous training. 
I think that uh, like Karim, whose father was an artist, and I think his mother was too, um, and uh, my parents also, my mother paints, my father uh, uh, was an architect. Um, I think when you grow up in an environment where that uh, visual way of thinking is just sort of a, the way you look at the world and it's accepted, then that's just the way you look at the world. Where did but, you go to school at for high school? Uh, Mimico High in Toronto. Okay, was that a discipline, sort of a high school environment? Yeah, no, it was a rough high school. Okay. You know, there were knife fights and things like that. Really? <laughs> You're kidding me. No. Okay. It was like a New York public school, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, so... Interesting. But, but I, think, I think Carleton, what, what was, what's nice about the university also is I think that the, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of education should be in a very remote and quiet cities and nice areas. So you you have 100% focus on that's, your that's degree. That's what I loved about Vassar, by the way. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. so beautiful. It was, yeah, it was so that's so what nice. I really appreciated about Carleton, yes. actually. I was so happy that Karen spoke about uh, materials because it's really what he's known for, what he's working on. It's very, very important to him. It's very important to include this in this interview. So he talks about how, you know, when uh, people first started to buy organic in the supermarket, you go to the organic aisle and it's everything is very much more expensive. But when people realize how important it is, then they're willing to spend more. It's the same thing. When you start to uh, create products using um, materials that are grown from recycled material, uh, out of tires, out of sugar, um, you know, people are not using sugar as much anymore. So you have all this sugar cane and you have to find new uses for it. And lo and behold, you can actually build furniture out of it. Now, that brings me to the next question, which is, I know that you love the sugar-based polymers and all of these ideas about using completely recyclable materials. Yeah. And so now that you've achieved this amazing fame in your career, and, and what would you like to do next, which is perhaps giving back to the world? I was thinking maybe remote areas where they really, really need, yeah, like Brazil or like Venezuela or like... Yeah, Nigeria. You, you know, well, let, let me step back for a second. Yes. In, in you know, 1971, I think it was that Earth Day was created in Montreal. And when I came to Canada as a child, we came to Montreal first. Um, Canada was so rigorous at being sustainable, and it was really, I think, part of these first generation Europeans, especially Northern Euro Nordic Europeans, the Germans, Dutch, Scandinavians that came to Canada that really uh, continued the sense of responsibility for the earth, you know? So I was brought up this way, and I remember as a child, we had three garbage cans in our house, and I'm six, seven years old, you know? And in, when I went to Carleton, Carleton was very, uh, was teaching what at that time was called universal design. And universal design, which I love the subject, is this idea that you could make, a, 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 let's say, a waste paper basket that an eight-year-old could use and an 80-year-old could which use. Which you actually have yeah. created. So, but those kind of objects, those universal objects, which which really can we can all, um, and I don't want to say all in the sense of trying to meet, I mean, all markets, because that's not necessarily, how can I say, sometimes things become too generic, but the idea that something works well for an elderly and can work well for somebody young. That's right. what universal design was really about. Right. So there was this sort of sense of responsibility of what you do. The second part, Carlton taught a lot, which, which was really important part of my education, was the notion of recyclability or let's say a cyclic product. So right. you design something and you already design the way it's going to end its cycle. Very few designers in the last 20 years, 30 years, think about when they design something, it what, what it, where is it going to end up or right. how is it going to end up? That's right. You know? Exactly. But now there's obviously mm -hmm. a, a, an interest, a global interest, obviously, because of a necessity, because, you know, the earth is dying slowly, is that we have to be responsible about these things now. So all of a sudden it's now the discourse. That's but absolutely. for me, it was always the discourse. It was always there. In fact, every material and everything I've done in the last 35 years I knew the factory, I knew the material, I knew where, where 
the product could end up or how it could end up. I knew whether it's cycle or not. And I used to, um, and I still do, to many companies, propose to them better materials. Now, the problem with that is, as a designer, a lot of times we're looked at as stylists. So somebody comes to us and says, oh, design is a new dish rack. And they're thinking that it's only about playing with the form, blah, blah, blah. and they're not asking for the other questions. So if I turn to them and say, you know what, right now you're using PVC, which is a really toxic plastic, right. don't use it. Why don't we use this instead? Many times there's a, a reluctance to those. It's not like they don't want me to bring that to the table. And they don't want designers a lot of times to bring something that's, let's say, going to change their um, production habits or means or their distribution or other things that is, are is beyond it, the design itself. Is it because itself. of their manufacturing or is it because it's more expensive for them to do it? There's a plethora of reasons. Right. I mean, you know, I, I know, for example, I've spoken to 10 companies that produce plastic furniture in the last 10 years. And I found a fantastic polymer um, that I love from Brazil. That's, that's the one you mentioned. Right, derived, the sugar. Derived from sugar. Right. It's, um, and... Um, and it nobody, gives, nobody, nobody wants to use it. But it's so perfect because it will give it will give employment in the country that needs it, and it, it's it's just totally it does so much. You know, I mean, we know we know for example we know that sugar we don't need sugar, right? We know right. that we we discovered it 270 years ago, right? And it's just basically causing cancer exactly at the end of the day, right? Yeah, and it causes fast food. It causes it, everything is uh, wrong diabetes. With it. Right. it causes obesity. And now you found a use everything. for it, which is so, the only good use for it. Now, this, these companies have been making, um, for example, yogurt packaging in it. A lot of, there's a lot of products out there right now made from the sugar. A lot of okay. products made from uh, cornstarch. A right. lot of products made from... By the way, corn is another thing you should never eat. Yeah, sure. Um, anyway, these things. So those, those plastics are right. out there. The, right. the thing is to use them on a bigger scale. Right. Very few people have attempted it. But also, when you're... How do they hold up in the long run, by the way, those chairs that are made? Well, well that's, that's the issue. So you have to design it in a, in a much more different way, in a more structural way. It's not as, not as let's say, high-performing, a lot of these polymers. Uh -huh. you know? okay. But you know what? You, you, you work with it. That's what we do. That's, as a good designer, that's what you're, you're doing. You have to would work you, with the material you, you have. Would you use strips? Like you'd have to design a chair made of slats so that it will hold up better and maybe in a weave? Oh, no, you could injection mold one whole piece. You're oh. just going to end up with... Um, uh, more ribs, stronger structure, maybe a heavier plastic chair, and inevitably a more expensive one, number one. Okay. Uh, also, the polymers are more expensive. But, but anyway. Okay. So, so now I know you said your best product was your O chair. I remember. Uh, I did say that? You when did. When did I say that? You said that in one of your <laughs> interviews. Somebody said to you, what did you think your best product was? And you said that it was the most successful product because <laughs> you, you were happy. You know what I think my best product is? Tell, it's tell not me. a product. It's, yeah. it's me inspiring ah. others. I'll, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. You Definitely. know, I, and, and the reason I say that is because I try to take the way I see the world and the way I want to create a kind of positive energy into the world, mm -hmm. and I try to imbue that in things. The thing is, when you imbue that in things, at the end of the day, it's still a thing that has a, a, a simple function. So it's not really going to speak at the level that one could speak that in words. In other words, words can say a lot more than an object can. So, you know, I can, if, I, if I write, if I speak, if I lecture, well, if I say you know, something, I think that, I can have more of an effect on the earth but, and on the world. Yes, but what, an object, look at this cup. You see it every day, you use it every day, and it has a memory. You have a memory of when you bought that cup. Right. And actually, it does sometimes say more than words. So I wanted to talk to you about that's that. interesting because all these sociologists and all these people out there now are arguing about what they are calling the epoch of experience. So, so that you it, should so you should spend your extraneous cash on experiences versus on things. things no, but every time you go somewhere and, and you buy a memento of that place, so actually they are interlinked. So for example, I wanted to talk to you about color. You know, you talk a lot about color, and I, I wanted to ask you. You know, pink, for example. I wore pink for you today. And I was thinking about it. I was like, what do I have that's pink? I actually went out and bought a pair of pink pants, which I didn't wear. Because I never bought pink pants before. And then I realized I have a lot of pink jewelry. Why? Because I believe in, in, in the power of gems. I, I do a lot of research. Amethyst, for example, is a protective stone. Rose quartz and so on. 
So did you ever look into that? Yeah, yeah, I know that I know right? all that quite so, well. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, I believe in that very, very mm. much. Yeah. So the same Bible say I thought you must know well, listen, about that, right? You know, Color is very listen, important. The whole universe is based on energies. Right. It's on particles, it's on uh, waves, and this is our existence. So um, anything is not necessarily innate or inert like you take a bowl over there that's sitting on that shelf that thing at some point are is changing it's aging with time as, as we everything is and it's forever in a kind of flux that's right you know so these things when we put them around us they give us a kind of positive sense of, of well-being or at the same time they become a hindrance of our well-being right and uh, and I'm 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 a big believer in this, yeah. Yes. And it, so so and us like human beings, you know, the difference is because we're we're organic and much more short lived than a lot of let's say material things. Uh, and we, we're made we, of water. Our our energy exactly, and, and mostly water. So our energy is much more let's say pow potent, powerful in the moment. Yes. Right. But when you design space. Space has a huge effect on how you feel, and a lot of a lot of us, and there hasn't been enough data accumulated in the last century of how designing a better space or a better thing can create a better life and, and, and bring a better positive energy to your existence. In Karim's uh, case, he explained it was very, very important to him to have natural sunlight and how different it was when he, when he had his first office. He hated it so much because it, he had no light. And then how happy he was when he had bought his second building because it was a wonderful space that uh, was, uh, you know, uh, from front to back. And what he did was he opened up from the uh, top floor to the bottom. He just completely opened up and made all glass so that you had sunlight pouring in uh, from morning to night. And uh, then his office, he just sort of took a balcony so that he got the light onto his office as well without taking away anything from the light coming into the office of the, uh, the front where we had our interview. And then it went sort of also into the back where his people were sitting um, at their desks. And then, uh, you know, it was like a townhouse so that it opened. Uh, he just opened everywhere he could. He opened uh, windows, which I, I think was a, the right thing to do. Beautiful space. Let me tell you a quick story. I had I, my first office, which was a small building that I, I bought on in Chelsea back in the 90s, was, you know, this place that was falling to pieces and I renovated it. And at the end of the day, my office in the back had no daylight. And we only had the daylight from a storefront at the front. So, you know, the closest to the front, the most light, right? And I put up with that for like 12, 13 years. Oh. And I was determined the next office I do I won't have to turn on a light bulb from nine till six. It's very important. And so the idea here was that you don't, there's no, we don't need to, to yeah, turn on lights. It's wonderful. And, and, I, uh, and, and we can just use the, the And I know that daylight. that's your office up there so that you, you, you share that light coming in. And yeah. even though you're facing north here, you're still getting light all day long. Yeah, you it's get a lot of, lot of light yeah, facing north. Yeah, it's really, really yeah. wonderful. It's um, difficult in New York to do that on a ground floor yeah. to find a lot of daylight. Yeah. So we have it coming in from the back and, and from the, the front. Yeah, yeah. it's re really, yeah. really beautiful. But you know, it's funny, there was a point when, it, and this is how important space is, there was a point where I started to hate going to my office. Aww. Because and I, when I was in my office, I didn't feel the least bit creative. In fact, all I did was feel all the burden of all the other issues, the problems, yes. you I, know, whether I, they financial, I, this, that. And I found myself staying more and more in my apartment to draw or to think or to design than in the office. This is almost the reverse. I feel so relaxed and so positive and so um, so creative here. That's what you want. And I think it's the energy that, that one, one can create. And if you look at something like, if you look at studies like Feng Shui as an example, yeah. you know, even though it's not really a science, right? It's more like a knowledge well, or something they, they would it's very it's, no it's very fundamental and a yes. lot of it is obvious and yeah. for someone who's a good designer who has never read anything or understood feng shui you'd be surprised how similar yeah. they're the, if they're a good designer yeah. how similar their thoughts yeah. are you know it's a very simple thing you walk in the door 
And if the back of the bed, we do, I design a lot of hotels, That's, is facing you, it's a no, no, it's obvious. It's obvious, absolutely. You know, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So these things are very... Yeah. And he talks about that in this interview. Um, but he did do something with industrial design, which no designer ever had done before. He made industrial design a beautiful, creative, the most creative. I think he is the most creative industrial designer that perhaps the world has ever seen. And that's why, as Canadians, we are so proud of him. What's your personally, something that has a, a soft spot in your heart that may not actually have done as well, but that you... Okay, let, let me say this, okay? I don't really think too much about that. Oh. Because, and I think it's so typical, probably, of people who are really creative, is their their brain is so full of what they're With working the on. And I'm, my, honestly, right now my brain is full. Everybody that loves what they do is never old because their minds are always youthful, are always looking for the next thing. It's, uh, it's fabulous. So when he says, um, you know, I I'm always passionate about the next project and I can't have a favorite because um, my favorite is always whatever I'm doing now. I totally understand what he's saying because, uh, you know, if ever I'm depressed, all I need is, you know, the next song to learn. Then I can't be depressed anymore. Totally, I totally understand him. I'm doing right now 14 hotels. Wow. I'm doing a hospital. Wow. And some great projects and, you know, restaurants and a gym and a spa and a lot of products and a lot of furniture and a lot of lighting and a lot of fashion things. I'm doing eyeglasses. So those things are really occupying my brain. So when I look at my things and I like looking at my things and I don't, uh, some of them I look at and I, I, I feel like I should have done much better, you know, like, yeah, like that I should improve. I, if I look at a but in general, I just walk by and I look at like the hairdryer and those things there. And I just feel like that was, that was a good product that, was, that worked really well. I feel accomplished a little bit, but I never feel like I've done enough. No, of course not. Right. No, God forbid. And on top of that, I never want to repeat myself. And this is, this is a tricky part about it because... I, I am searching constantly to want to do something original. For me, you know, a luxurious life, luxury I define now in the 21st century, is when you're on this earth doing what you were meant exactly. to do. Exactly. My father used to say, if you do what you love, then it's not work. Yeah. Well, it's always work, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, because why? Work... As, you're looking at the word work as a negative. No, right, okay. Do you get what yes, I mean? Yes, exactly. Yes. And when people say, yes. oh, but you know, okay, but that's, you can't define yourself by what you do. I think it's the opposite. I think that's how we define ourselves, about what we're capable of and what we do, completely. Okay. Yeah. I don't think those two things are disparate. Okay. The reason they're disparate is because a lot of people do things that they're not really... Happy at. Hap no, not happy at, but it wasn't their destiny. Oh, you know? I think, okay, I have something to talk to you about then, because here we are. This is something that you talk about a lot. You say, um, and this is something I wanted to bring up with you, that like all great artists and all great thinkers, you've come up with your own lexicon. You have said style, instead of art history, what most people talk about is art history, you say is style. Yes. And you say we are now a data-driven digital age, the age of casualism. And instead of you say that design is now a democratic art. Right. And you say we're all pioneers. And I actually, and which I Boy, love. Boy, you really did your research. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I have to disagree with you. I actually okay. don't think, although I, because I'm a very creative person, but I don't think that every person on earth is capable of creativity. We had a bit of a clash uh, at, towards the end of the interview. Karen says, that it's now, art is now democratic and that everybody can be a designer. I wholeheartedly disagree with him. I don't believe anybody can be a designer 
as much as I don't believe anybody can be a jeweler, as much as I don't believe anybody can be a truck driver, I think anything requires passion, determination, and a certain modicum of talent, a certain modicum of a, you have to be drawn to something. You have to have an innate intelligence for it. You have to then be educated in that thing. You have to be able to know how to do it and want to do it and be able to do it well. And he thinks, so oh, no, anybody can do this. I don't disagree. I don't agree. As children, the first thing we do is we create. First thing. We, with our fingers, with a pencil in our hand, with an iPad, whatever, whatever they can grab, make something, right? Build blocks. As soon as you start putting blocks on top of each okay. other, start playing with Legos, yes. you're creating. Yes. So it's innate in us, this notion of creation. It's our brain is wired this way to create, unlike any other animal on the earth. So that's why we progress and that's why we evolve. Okay. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean everybody ends up being creative at the end of the day because society, suppression, conformity, parents, whoever pushes creativity down. Last century, when you, when you talked about this, about wanting to be an opera singer, is that the reason your parents push you down is creative fields in general were looked at as a negative because children weren't going to make a living from it. We're going to have a, you know, all this stuff. You know, how many students, how many students I had that their parents didn't want them there in the school and even didn't understand what they're really doing, yeah. why they're there. And this was industrial design, which is even more of a commercial profession than going into fine arts or yeah. into performing arts or something else, right? Yes. So anyway, so there's this desire to create. Now, the suppression over time ends up that, let's say, 95% of the population is not really creative or creating, but inside them is a gene to create. You really think? Yes. And what I think is the way they end up, the outlet of that is procreation because you create something original. Because by the way, just to define what creation is, creation is not just making something. Creation is when you do something original. It's an original act that you contributed to the earth, okay. to the world. So procreation is an original act right away, right? So there's procreation, intellectual creation. And that's what we do to evolve us, progress us, and for survival. And by the way, people aren't even doing so much of that as they used to. Well, we should do a lot less. If, if, it, if it was up to me, if that was up to me, nobody in the world could have more than two children. And in a hundred years, we start to solve most of our problems. That's also you know? true, right? But, but people look at that as a kind of fascist uh, idea or statement, but I, 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 no, I don't understand why on earth. A lot of earth. people aren't even having that, right? It's yeah. actually Well, no, a opposites. There's, there's, there's two sides of there the are world. There are people that are having much they're, more. They're, yeah, and, and, there's, and there's a lot of the societies that actually probably should be having children that are not. One of the lovely um, things that happened in the interview uh, was that I felt that we had a, a very nice connection and at one point Karim started talking about uh, the fact that he had been married two times or I don't know how many times and, and I said me too and uh, you know I think I even said you know uh, that each you know uh, partner is the right partner for the the right time in your life and he said yeah and um, he he uh, he helped me he was like you know he, he made me feel better about uh, my previous partners. And now you talk about how romantic your father was, that he, I, I love the story of how your father used to sew a dress for your mom and he would, and she would wear it on Saturday night. Yeah. I think that's like the most beautiful story I've ever heard. So how, what have you done for your wife on a Saturday night? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, I'm divorced. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Twice now. Um, okay. But I'm a romantic. So with both of, of my wives and my relationships I've had, I'm very, very like romantic. I do all kinds of stuff, but but um, but n nothing could compare with that. So am I, by the way, two times. Oh yeah. Don't feel bad. Okay. That so the I don't time. feel bad. I, th I think I think it's the opposite. I think you know somebody could have fifty relationships in their life and never get married, and when someone gets divorced twice or three times, they we frown upon that. Why? You know, right? I, I always say, you know, a marriage should be 10 years and then call it a day. And actually, I think I've had somebody say, <laughs> that, you know, each each wife I had was perfect for the time that I had. And that's yeah. sort of how I look at it. Too. Exactly. Exactly. So my favorite chair 
in uh, in the collection that we saw there was this really funky um, sort of uh, was like two chairs that were facing each other. There was room for a champagne bottle in between. And uh, when I asked him, what is your favorite uh, or most romantic chair, I said. And he said, it was that one, the Veuve Clicquot. So what was the most romantic product that you created? Oh, my God. These questions are tough. Oh, good. Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> what was the most romantic product? Why? Well, I would say it's the Verve Clicquot love seat. The Verve. Oh, the one I wanted to sit in. I the wanted pink to. One. Yes. That's the then one I wanted to do the interview. Let me tell you why. When Verve Clicquot asked me to make some accessories to, to let's say, um, promote their, the champagne, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I don't know how. Oh yes, I started looking at French, some French literature, and I was reading uh, Tufun Orel. And Tufun Orel said something about, um, it was a whole chapter on courting. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned um, this idea of love seats, that in the 17th, 18th century, at the beginning of Romanticism, a man and a woman who, who didn't know each other in public weren't allowed to be sitting side by side. So the chair was created, the original ones in wood, so that I would sit here, let's right. say, and That's, you would sit there. Right. And then you would basically almost not look, but speak like this, right? So I thought that was really beautiful, actually. That's, yeah. And, uh, and uh, so I ended up making a kind of contemporary version of it's, that. It's a wonderful chair. We were looking at it. And one comment that he made that really worried me was when he was like, oh, I hate history, or I hate, um, I think he said something like, I hate uh, weather or something like this. And I was like, wait, Karen, you can't say that on uh, on the video. Like, it's going to come back and bite you, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes artists just say things like that. But I don't like nature. You don't? And the reason, let me explain. Of course I love nature. But the reason I don't like it is because it kills us. Nature kills us? Yes. Okay, explain okay. that statement. Well, hurricanes, typhoons, wiping up tornadoes. Oh, that's what you mean. It kills us. We die, all of us. I We're see. mortal I because see. of nature. In other words, we, we look at nature in a, in a distant perspective of looking at the Grand Canyon and going, wow, how beautiful. At the same time, when there's a phenomenal typhoon that wipes out six, 7,000 people, that's nature, too. Nature's a very difficult, destructive, dystopic phenomena gotcha you know so that's why number two about history history we learn from it yes yes if so i know if i know smart. okay i know everything about the history of design okay and even probably architecture probably art i you know i studied and 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 read and i'm so became so hyper aware of for so many years of everything there's a good side and a bad side to that the good side is my knowledge, right? That I can also maybe work off what I've learned. The bad side is to try to do something original when you know too much. So you lose that sense of naivete, let's say, right? And the wonder. And, and, and wonder and all, exactly. Um, wonder is a good word for that. So anyway, I, um, I, but I, what I realized about history, I was in, and this is the epiphany, I was in Cairo 15 years ago at the Modern Art Museum and there was a chair, folding chair, that's 3,200 years old. Right. And the mechanism, the way it folded, was exactly like still today many of our wooden folding chairs. Amazing. Yeah. It, it was beautiful. And when yeah. I saw that, I thought to myself, you see... Everything old is new again. That, that's the original. Now, if, if you see a Tolex stool, which is everybody knows now because it's become so fashionable and so trendy. These metal stools that are in bars and pizza places and everything, restaurants, or the chair, the metal chair, they were from 1926, Tolex, from France. Now, the chairs we're seeing in every restaurant all over the world are not the Tolex from France. They're not the originals. They're the knockoff of the knockoff of the knockoff. Right. Just like Eames's chairs are being knocked off. Right, right. So my belief is I respect the original thing. If you love antiques, if you have real antiques, that's one thing to mm -hmm. be in your house. If you walk into your house and your house is full of knockoffs by Ethan Allen or whoever, right. some company, right. what are you, who are you kidding? In other words, it's kitsch. It's all fake. 
It's like designing a fake scenography, a set for a, for a film from the 1900s or That's 1800s. Right. Okay. That's my issue. So I'm really, you know, on the fence. And I think, let live and let live. You know, if what you love is the look of 18th century and you can't afford fine antiques, which who can? Buy what you love and live and let live. So we should really surround ourselves or live with things that A, bring meaning to our lives, B, that talk about the time in which we live because we're only here now. So we exist at this moment in time. So why wouldn't the things around us be of the time? And my argument is example, you buy a car. Are you going to go out now and buy a car with a horse and buggy? Well, some or do people you buy love a... antiques, right? Some people love the feel Real of anti- it. I'm, I'm good. I'm, right. I, for them, I, I respect that. Right. I respect that. I mean, if I had tomorrow, a, uh, I don't know, a, the same way we a were sketch from about Picasso memento. on my wall, I would right. love, you know? Right. You know, I respect those things. Those are the original, is what I'm trying right. to say. Right. It's, it's The problem is that the majority of us are not inter- interacting with originals. So I'll, I'll we're just, living just with to play devil's offs. advocate, will you permit me? Sure. So say somebody says, I love, I would love that sketch of Picasso, or I feel an affinity with the 18th century, and I can't afford that. Why can't I have something that makes me feel... Uh, here's my question. What's the, how do you have an affinity to the 18th century maybe when you I never lived, existed then? Well, maybe I lived in maybe. that life. Maybe I feel a past maybe. life. Of- Possibly. I don't know. I, I would say that a lot of times we are subject to feeling some sort of c- comfort in, in the past and versus uh, a, a kind of, and a fear of the present. I know that um, I, at one point I asked him, you know, because I really want, I, I was, we were having such a great time and I wanted us to agree on, on everything. And uh, so I said, well, you know, can't you just love, you know, one of the things that I love, which is uh, 18th century um, furniture. And he was like, no, everything has to be contemporary because we live in a contemporary world. And Maybe. especially in the domestic environment, you know, it's amazing, even domestic environment. But, you know, sometimes these modern, modern uh, con- contrivances are harsh. And sometimes... Well, they- they're, they're badly designed. There's modern things that are beautiful. Listen, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a runner, okay? When I run, I have the latest, best running shoes I can wear. If I buy a new car, it's run by a computer. If it's Tesla, it has that's, a screen that's big inside it. Those are very expensive. So no. you know what? I'm a runner too, but you know where I have to run? I have to run in the pool. You know why? Because I have a bad knee. Okay. So there's there are... But that has nothing to do with history. I'm but, talking about but, history now. Uh, but, okay, but I'm going to... Because... Because sometimes people can't afford the very, very best. But this of has nothing design. to do with affording. Nothing. You don't think? No. No, that's always like saying, oh, I don't dress so well because Eames, I don't have any money. Dressing well is about... No, you go about, to a vintage store. Sure. And you go to a secondhand think, store. My, and you get my point a, is that's, an original 1940s. It's the wrong argument. Tell me why. No, it's the wrong argument of saying that you can't afford something. That's no, why. I'll say you go to a sure, the exactly. Goodwill and you buy a so, 1940s so, pencil so, skirt. Okay. But so, it, so, so I would buy the original. So buy buy some used furniture that's contemporary. But I would you know? get 1950s teak. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I don't want to get into those details. My point, my point being is, you exist now. Yeah, I have an eye watch on, right? This thing is not a watch. It does far more than anything. I wear running shoes that are super high performance. I wear stretch jeans because they feel super comfortable. I travel with t-shirts that don't wrinkle. All these things. This is the contemporary world we live in. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So why why do I want to live or make my life more difficult when in actually the contemporary world is making it better? There I completely agree you know? with you. I get you. Yeah, and that's all. Okay. That's my whole issue with, with, with history. So history is something to look at, to respect, but we live in, in the present. This is Sharon Azrielli for Home in Canada. I hope you had as much fun as I did learning about Karen Rashid. I'm so excited to tell you that we will be having more videos with Frank Gehry, Moshe Safdi, and Mike Holmes, among others. So please stay tuned and check us out online at homeincanada.ca.